and see Alicia Castro, the Ambassador of the Argentine Republic to the United Kingdom. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Kezia Dugdale. President Officer, I know that I speak for all sides when I say that the thoughts and prayers of everyone in this chamber are with the family of Bailey Gwynn, who was stabbed and killed at a school in Aberdeen yesterday. We offer our full support to the parents, pupils and staff at this tragic time. Can I ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day? First Minister. Presiding Officer, may I begin today by expressing my shock and sadness at the incident which occurred yesterday at Cults Academy in Aberdeen. I also want to convey my deepest sympathy and condolences to the family and friends of Bailey Gwynn, who tragically died in the incident. While the circumstances of this young man's death are subject to ongoing and thorough police investigation, I'm sure that the whole chamber will want all those who loved Bailey and indeed all those at the school who have been affected by this tragedy to know that our thoughts are very much with them at this desperately sad time. Uh, later today, Presiding Officer, I have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. I appreciate that statement from the First Minister and know that she will be as shocked as anyone by this incident. Presiding Officer, I have four questions here and I will use most of them to hold the Government to account in the normal way. But I'd like to use my first question to ask about the death of Bailey Gwynn. We don't know all the details of the case yet, but there are countless families across the country who will feel this pain and sorrow today. It's every parent's worst nightmare, sending their child off to school in the morning, only for them never to return home again. Can the First Minister reassure parents right across the country that everything that can be done is being done to keep our children safe? First Minister. Uh, yes, indeed, of course, uh, I can and should give that assurance. Um, the Chamber may want to know that I have this morning spoken to the leader of Aberdeen City Council to offer our sympathies and condolences, but also to convey directly to her that any support and assistance that the Council uh, or the school needs from the Scottish Government in the days, weeks and months ahead will be forthcoming. You know, incidents like this are deeply shocking uh, and deeply tragic, and the impact on the lives of those who knew and loved Bailey Gwynn are impossible for any of us to imagine. Uh, notwithstanding that, of course, it is also important to uh, remember and to remind ourselves that tragic incidents like this one are thankfully extremely rare in our schools. Uh, that does not, of course, take away at all uh, from the tragic nature of this incident. Uh, the Scottish Government will, uh, in the fullness of time, make sure that any lessons that require to be learned from this incident are learned. Uh, and I think while I do give the assurance that we will continue to take all steps uh, to ensure, as far as any government possibly can, the safety of our young people in our schools, it is worth also uh, remembering that uh, violent incidents, incidents of young people possessing uh, knives and dangerous weapons, uh, are on the decline. Now, that is no reason for complacency, because as the tragic events of the last uh, 24 uh, hours have reminded us, one incident like this is one too many. And I'm sure we are united today in our determination to make sure that no young person ever has to go through this again. Can I thank the First Minister for that very welcome and fulsome reply? President Officer, I'd like to turn now to the question of student finance. Figures published by SAS this week show that under the SNP government, the average student bursary or grant has been cut by almost 30%. And it's the poorest students who are suffering. Students from deprived backgrounds being forced to take on an even greater debt burden. Students who have the potential to get on in life and to do great things, but who are being held back because their parents don't have a lot of money. It's that gap between the richest and the rest that has grown on the SNP's watch. Now, I know the First Minister will talk about tuition fees in answer to my next question. It's her standard response whenever we talk about student debt and grants. But I'd like her to answer this question very specifically. Can the First Minister tell us the total value of student debt in Scotland? First Minister. Well, I'm not going to talk about tuition fees. I'm going to talk about student support because that's what Kezia Dugdale has asked me and it's an important question. Uh, we have the best support package for students in the whole of the UK. Now, presiding officer, those are not actually... 
those are not actually my words. They are the words of NUS Scotland. The number of students receiving support is higher than ever before, and the average support provided is higher than it has ever been before. And when you look at average student loan debt, what you find is that the figure for Scotland is significantly lower than any other part of the United Kingdom. So in England, the figure is £21,180. In Wales, it is £19,010. In Northern Ireland, it is £18,160. And in Scotland, it is £9,440. Uh, that is the reality. Now, Kezia Dugdale may or may not uh, be aware uh, that the Scottish Government has also taken the step of increasing the bursary element of the student support package in this academic year. And in the next academic year, uh, we're also raising the income threshold for eligibility for the maximum bursary. And it's those changes that were described, again by NUS Scotland, in the following terms. Great news for Scottish students. The Scottish Government is to be congratulated for doing more to tackle student poverty. So that's what the Scottish Government is doing. And we will continue to make sure that we take action to ensure that all of those who want to go into further or higher education across our country can do so regardless of their background or circumstances. There's a lot of gloss in that answer, presiding officer, but the reality is when you look, when you look, when you look specifically at the student support for the poorest students in Scotland, that is the worst of all the four nations of the United Kingdom. Now, I asked her very specifically about student debt. And I actually think on this occasion, presiding officer, the First Minister did know the answer, but she was too ashamed to say it out loud. Because the value of student debt in Scotland stands at £2.7 billion. Or as Alex Salmond might put it, £2,700 million. Presiding officer, the value of student debt in Scotland is more than the combined cost of the new Forth Road crossing, and the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow. In fact, the value of the accumulated debt of students in Scotland, it's now the government's single biggest financial asset. The student debt monster the SNP once promised to dump is now a debt mountain. Did the First Minister ever have any intention of keeping that promise? First Minister. Now, what Kezia Dugdale simply cannot escape is that average student loan debt in Scotland is significantly lower than anywhere else in the UK. And Scottish domiciled students, and here I will talk about tuition fees, do not have to pay fees of up to £27,000 uh, charged for tuition elsewhere in the UK. That is a real saving that doesn't become a debt in Scotland in the way it does in other parts of the UK. And currently, if the least well-off students in England and Scotland uh, took up the maximum amount of student loan available to them during the term of their degree, English students would accumulate debts of around £12,000 more than Scottish students. That is the reality. Uh, we have the best student support package in the UK. Average student debt in Scotland is less than it is in any other part of the UK. We are taking steps to increase the bursary element of the total student support package. And that, presiding officer, stands in sharp contrast to what the UK government is currently doing, not content with imposing tuition fees. The Chancellor announced in his budget statement, of course, that they're going to abolish bursaries altogether and move entirely to loan funding, something that the Scottish government will not do. President pre Officer, that's all from a First Minister who told students that their debt would be zero. Yeah. Judge me on my record, we were told by the First Minister. So here it is. The reality is that today it is easier to be poor and get to uni in England, even under the Tories, than it is in Scotland under the SNP. I heard cries of shameful. Yes, it is shameful. <laughs> She promised, she promised to abolish student debt. Instead, it has increased. She promised to expand grants. Instead, they have been cut. Isn't it the case that despite all the promises and all the moments of self-congratulation, the SNP government is letting down Scotland's poorest students? 
First Minister. Well, firstly, as I just said, and I think both of my previous answers, we've in this academic year increased the bursary element of the student support package. It was well, Order. it was that it Order. was that the led the NUS to say that the Scottish Government should be congratulated for doing more to tackle student poverty. There's been a 50% increase since 2006 in applications to university from the 20% most deprived areas in our country. Young people are more likely to participate in higher education by the time they're 30 uh, than was the case in 2006. And on the precise issue of student debt, let me just repeat some of the figures, because these are the figures that matter to people uh, and to students across Scotland. In Scotland, average student loan debt is £9,440. In England, it is £21,180. And in Wales, which the last time I looked was governed by a Labour administration, average student loan debt was £19,010. Oh. Double almost what it is in Scotland. So we live in tough financial times, presiding officer. Everybody knows that, and tough choices always have to be made. But we will continue to make sure that we are providing good support for our students so that more of our students from the most deprived parts of our country can take the opportunity to go to university. So we'll continue to get on with the job and, as usual, we'll leave Labour, regardless of what we do, to moan about it and whinge from the sidelines. Question number two. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I add the condolences of myself and my party to those that have already been expressed by the First Minister and the whole Parliament to the family and loved ones of Bailey Gwynne? Our thoughts and prayers are with all those who have been affected by this terrible tragedy. Could I also ask the First Minister, Presiding Officer, when she will next meet the Prime Minister? First Minister. I have no plans in the immediate future. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presiding Officer, we have just heard a, a series of quite serious exchanges uh, regarding funding and access to university. But in none of those exchanges did I hear a credible alternative plan on how we fund bursaries for poorer students and ensure the wider access we all say that we want. So here's one. Under our plans, we would ask all graduates who'd enjoyed their university education to pay back a contribution once they'd got a decent job. That money could then be used to help increase bursaries okay. for poorer students who, under the current scheme, can't even get a foot through the door. This plan is sensible, it is moderate, and it would help those most in need. Can I ask what reason, other than an ideological one, would this First Minister have for not considering it? First Minister. Right. You know, credit to Ruth Davidson. She's putting forward her policy, which is to, to support the introduction of tuition fees, and she is absolutely entitled to put that before the Scottish people at the election in a few months' time and allow them to cast their verdict on it. We have an honest disagreement. I believe in free education. I benefited it from, from it as a young person and I believe I have no right to take it away from any other young person today. So we will have that debate in the months to come. <laughs> Students uh, who graduate and who benefit from a university uh, education uh, pay back that through taxation. That's, I believe, what should happen, uh, not uh, to have tuition fees or a graduate tax or whatever terminology Ruth Davidson wants to use. And we will continue to take the steps that I outlined uh, in detail to Kezia Dugdale to support students uh, from our poorest backgrounds to go to university. I've already said, so I won't repeat it at length, that we've increased the bursary element of the student support package. I've also uh, cited the figures that show the lower levels of uh, student loan debt here in Scotland. Uh, Ruth D D Davidson will also be aware uh, that right now we have a commission on widening access uh, underway to advise the government on what additional steps we require to take to support poorer students into university. So we'll continue to do that hard and serious work and we'll have the, the honest uh, debate about uh, the funding options that Ruth Davidson talks about as we approach the election next year. Ruth Davidson. I'd like to thank the First Minister for that answer and for confirming that it, that it is an ideological point of view, that the SNP has written a so-called free education on a tablet of stone. Do you know, I, I think it's sad that this First Minister is, is too stubborn to recognise a need for change because change is needed. 
Because the facts are these, presiding officer, only one in ten of our poorest 18-year-olds are getting to university. But you're three and a half times more likely to go if you're rich. She talked about her own situation growing up. Well, ours growing up was pretty similar. I was on a full grant of student support when I went to university too, and that's what helped me get there. And for all the talk of widening access commissions, this SNP government has singularly failed to close the gap between rich and poor in access to university in more than eight years of office. Presiding officer, we have a solution and it works. And all we ask is that the First Minister has the courage to ditch the stone carvings and the vanity projects and to move to practical solutions for our poorest students. Will she? First Minister. Ruth, Ruth Davidson calls it ideological. I call it principle. It will be for the people of Scotland to make up their minds. But Ruth Davidson will put forward her policy. I'll put forward my policy at the election, and I'm happy to allow the Scottish people to be the judge of that. But in the meantime, we'll continue the hard work to ensure that everybody has an equal chance of going to university. That's why we've established... That's why we've established the Widening Access Commission. And as I said, since 2006, there has been a 50% increase in applications to university from those in the most deprived parts of our country. But you know what? I will take no lectures uh, from a representative of the, a party that right now is effectively raising the tax rate for the poorest people in our community by up to 90% as a result as a result of working tax credit cuts. And perhaps Ruth Davidson would be better advised uh, to wonder what effect those cuts is going to have on those in the poorest parts of our community. Such as the supplementary, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President. Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the disappointing news this week uh, that wave developer Aqua Marine Power has called in administrators. These are worrying times for the staff employed at a company that has achieved a great deal in taking forward the development of wave energy in this country, including an EMEC in my own constituency in Orkney. Can the First Minister offer a reassurance that her government and its agencies are doing everything in their uh, power to support the company and its staff in securing a positive outcome and early exit from administration? And will she agree to lend weight to the efforts of her energy minister by getting personally involved in discussions with stakeholders about how we secure the future success, not not just of the wave, but the wider marine energy development in Scotland. First Minister. Uh, yes, I'm happy to give uh, Liam MacArthur those assurances. The news that Aquamarine Power Limited had entered administration was obviously very disappointing. Uh, we very much hope that a buyer can be found for what is uh, and has been a leading Scottish wave energy firm. Uh, I was pleased to know that the administrators will continue to trade the company while they seek a buyer and that all 14 staff are being retained. But the Scottish Government remains absolutely committed uh, to the marine energy sector, but also to doing everything we can uh, to help secure a buyer for aquamarine uh, power. It's also important to point out, and I'm sure Liam MacArthur would acknowledge this, that we recently took steps to strengthen our commitment to the sector by establishing uh, Wave Energy Scotland. Um, that's the biggest wave technology development programme of its kind. Uh, and we did that precisely because we recognise the challenges uh, that the industry faces just now, specifically uh, the lack of private backers. So we'll continue to back the industry and the sector, uh, but I can also assure the Chamber uh, that we'll do everything we can to back uh, those who work in this particular company at what I know will be a difficult and challenging time for them. Question three, Willard Rennie. Thank you, President Officer. I'm sure we all appreciate the way that the community has rallied round in Aberdeen at, following the horrific circumstances at Culps Academy. Our thoughts, I think, are with the family, the friends, but also the wider community in this really difficult time. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the <coughs> Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Will there be any? I have just listened to exchanges between the First Minister, Ruth Davidson and Kezia Dugdale. For five years, I have been lectured by the First Minister on student finance. All the while, all the while, her government was breaking its promise to dump the debt. <laughs> It has. Order! Let's hear Mr. Rennie, please. I have Order. been lectured for five years. It's not been dumped, it's been doubled. But the question I want to ask the First Minister is this When will her government? 
publish an estimate of the potential number of refugees who could be accommodated in Scotland. That estimate would help to keep up the pressure on the Conservative Government to be compassionate to the plight of refugees by accommodating more here. When will we get that estimate? First Minister. Um, well, firstly, can I uh, thank Willie Rennie from the very bottom of my heart just a few months before the Scottish Parliament election uh, for so bravely reminding the Scottish electorate of the Liberal Democrats' record on tuition fees. <laughs> that was indeed... was indeed... That was indeed a most charitable thing for him to have done. But on the very serious and important matter of uh, refugees, I'm very happy to ask Hamza Yousaf to update Willie Rennie directly on the work of the task force that I established. But in short, our position here in Scotland is as it has been from the outset. Uh, we want to, are willing to and are preparing to take a proportionate share of the number of refugees that come to the United Kingdom. Now, clearly, uh, the number that are permitted to come to the United Kingdom is not something within uh, our control. That's something that is determined by the UK government. The Prime Minister has said uh, that 20,000 over the life of this Westminster Parliament will be uh, admitted from the camps around Syria. We are arguing for uh, that number to go higher and for it to extend not just to the camps around Syria but to uh, refugees who have already made the journey to Europe. The task force is ensuring that everybody uh, who needs to be involved in this are working together to make sure uh, that we have plans in place to accommodate uh, refugees. Uh, we don't know yet uh, precisely the numbers uh, and the profile of that 20,000 that has been committed to already. Uh, we would, I think, expect to see some refugees coming to Scotland uh, before Christmas and we're working very hard to make sure that we can accommodate them and look after them properly. Will there any? Just for completeness on student finance, we will... We Order! Will, Order, let us hear Mr Rennie, please. We, we will take every opportunity to remind people that this government promised that it would dump the debt, but it has doubled the debt. We will take every opportunity to remind people. But on refugees, we need... Order! Well, it's all well and fine for people to laugh about refugees, but I think they will not find it difficult in these circumstances. Order! We, we need an estimate. We need an estimate of how many Scotland could take. But her minister said to us this week that he had prepared no such estimate after months on the job. The First Minister has said Scotland will take its Barnet share of refugees. But surely, but surely we should be more compassionate than a technical accounting rule when lives are at stake. I think, I think the members should listen to this very serious I think, subject, Mr Rennie, you should just get on with it. Winter is coming, President Officer. Winter is coming which will leave many refugees vulnerable. We could send a powerful message to the Conservative Government by agreeing to take more. We should act now. Does she not agree? First Minister. What I think is, and I don't want to overstate this, President Officer, but I think Willie Rennie should be mildly ashamed of himself about the tone of this question today. Willie Rennie, to his credit, as did uh, Kezia Dugdale and Ruth Davidson, sat around the table at the summit that I convened a few weeks ago. And, you know, I think we uh, agreed there a degree of consensus about the approach Scotland would take. I'm not setting some technical Barnet share. I want Scotland to do as much as possible, but it has been, I think, an appropriate starting point to say that we would take a proportionate share of the refugees uh, that come here. That's why we are focused just now on the work that would support around 2,000, which is a proportionate and reasonable share of the 20,000 that David Cameron has said will uh, be admitted to the UK over the life of this parliament. But I'm also saying I would like to see the Prime Minister go further than that, go further than that in two ways. Firstly, in terms of the number, and secondly, in terms of the reach of that programme. Now, I think that is the appropriate way uh, to behave, to 
argue for a, a, a more expansive approach from the UK government, but to do the hard work, which Hamza Yousaf is leading just now, to make sure that we have the practical preparations in place uh, to take that proportionate share. So we will get on with that work. And I really do hope, and this is a genuine invitation to Willie Rennie, that he'll come back into the consensus rather than trying to make cheap political points out of an issue that is so important. Question four, John McAlpine. To ask the First Minister what correspondence the Scottish Government's had with the UK Government on its discredited plans to cut tax credits by April 2016. First Minister. Uh, the Deputy First Minister wrote to the Chancellor in early July to set out the Scottish Government's concerns about the UK Government's plan to cut tax credits. On July the 20th, the SNP, together with Plaid Cymru, the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, voted against the second reading of the Welfare Bill. Uh, Labour Party in that vote abstained. Uh, on the 23rd of October, the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice wrote to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, again voicing our serious concerns about the proposed reductions. And I would take this opportunity again today, Presiding Officer, to urge the Chancellor to think again and to abandon a misguided policy that will penalise hard-working families across Scotland and the UK. Can I just take this opportunity to remind members that you should keep to the words that are actually on the order sheet and not add additional words to it? Joe McAlpine. Thank you very much. Uh, can the First Minister offer the Chancellor any advice on how he should proceed with his discredited plans to cut tax credits to working families now that he has been told to go back and think again? First Minister. Well, I think he should abandon those plans. Uh, I don't believe they are right, but I also don't believe they are necessary. Uh, George Osborne has said uh, on a number of occasions this week he's in listening mode, but if he is genuinely serious about listening, he will admit that he's made a serious mistake here and reverse uh, these damaging proposals. Uh, the analysis the Scottish Government uh, has done of the impact of the proposed uh, changes show that a quarter of a million working households and tax credits could lose an average of £1,500 a year just from the changes to be brought in next April. In the longer term, if the full set of cuts are implemented, low-income households with children could lose on average around £3,000 a year. I think uh, these changes would be unconscionable, uh, presiding officer, and I hope very much that the Chancellor uses his autumn statement and the comprehensive spending review to say that he is not proceeding with them. Question five, Jenny Mara. To ask the First Minister whether a reduction in the number of training places for nurses and midwives has contributed to the rise in agency nursing costs, as highlighted by Audit Scotland. First Minister. Uh, under this government, the number of qualified nurses and midwives working in our NHS has gone up by over 2,200. Uh, that's an increase of over 5%, and it takes the number of qualified nurses and midwives in our NHS to historically high levels. On the question of agency nurses, uh, when we took office, there were 728.2 whole-time equivalent agency nurses working in NHS Scotland. In 2014-15, this had been reduced to just 191 whole-time equivalent nurses. That's a reduction of 73.8% in agency nursing under this government. Jenny Mara. <laughs> Presiding officer, the First Minister says that after eight years that we should judge the SNP on their record. Well, Audit Scotland, Audit Scotland last week passed judgment on her record. The First Minister herself took the decision to cut training places when she was health secretary. Scotland's nurses have told us the consequences, quadrupled agency spend from £3.9 million to £16 million. This mismanagement led her to the damning report card she was given last week. Presiding officer, after eight years in government and her failure to address previous warnings, does the First Minister now agree with Audit Scotland that we need fundamental change in how we deliver and staff our health service? First Minister. Of course, it is this government that is coming forward with those change proposals from the transformation in primary care through to the expansion of elective treatment centres. This is the government that is getting on with the job. But let me turn to uh, nurses uh, and nurses in training. Num the number of nurses in training has been on average 
a thousand a year higher under this administration than was the case under the Labour Liberal administration. There are 2,200 more qualified nurses working in our NHS today than when we took office. The vacancy rates are broadly the same. There were 3.6% when we took office, 3.7% now. Agency spend is lower than when we took office. Uh, Jenny Mara cites the figure of £16 million. Uh, it's worth pointing out to the Chamber that's 13% lower than the £18 million it was when we inherited the position from the last Labour government. So, Presiding Officer, uh, our NHS today, in, in common with health systems uh, across the developed world, faces real challenges and real pressures, uh, mainly from the changing demographics of our country. And we see more evidence of that uh, in the Registrar General's report this morning. Uh, but we will continue to make sure that our NHS and all who work in it are supported to face up to those challenges so that it can continue to do the excellent job that it already does. Question six, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I associate the Green and Independent Group with all of the comments made regarding the tragic events at Cults Academy? And can I ask the First Minister what proportion of the labour force has a secure job that pays at least the living wage? First Minister. The latest figures show that over 80% of employees in Scotland are paid at least the living wage. Uh, this represents a higher proportion of the workforce than anywhere else in the UK outside of London and the south east of England. There are now over 370 uh, Scottish-based living wage accredited employers with workers from a variety of sectors across Scotland benefiting from the progress that is being made. Uh, that's good progress, presiding officer, but there is no room for complacency. We want to see the living wage extend even further. Uh, next week, of course, is Living Wage Week. As part of that, uh, my ministers and I will be promoting the living wage at events throughout the country, and I would encourage MSPs from across the chamber to do likewise. Patrick Carvey. Thank you. There has been, uh, and I'm pleased to welcome this, an increasing emphasis across society on the quality of employment rather than just the, the overall job numbers in our economy. And the Fair Work Convention and the Business Pledge are good steps uh, to add momentum to that agenda, uh, as well as the New Economics Foundation's recent report uh, citing job quality as one of the national indicators of success. But we do still provide business support services and grants from the Scottish Government, uh, which are contingent mostly on job numbers, headline job numbers, and don't place the same emphasis on job quality. Isn't it time to start putting every bit as much emphasis on job quality when we decide on the eligibility for government support services and grants paid for by the taxpayer? First one. I think Patrick Harvey raises a fair point and through the Fair Work Convention and the approach we're taking through the Business Pledge, of course, we will continue to consider uh, issues like that. I also think for people uh, out there across the country, job numbers do matter, but he's absolutely right to say that the quality of work matters as well. Uh, we want to see uh, more full-time work for people who want it, uh, rather than uh, people being in jobs where they're working fewer hours than they would like to work. And we want to make sure uh, that people in jobs are being paid a decent living wage, that they have good working conditions, they're respected and, and well rewarded uh, in the job that they do. That's the whole focus uh, of the Business Pledge and the Fair Work Convention. And crucially, and this I, th I think gets to uh, the, the heart of why we are seeking to develop a partnership approach with business around this, because uh, my message to business is not that they should do all these things because government says so, it's that they should do all these things because it's good for their business as well as good for our society. And I think we're making real headway on that argument in Scotland, and I hope we've got the support of the Chamber to push even further ahead on it. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now moving to Members' business. Members who leave the Chamber should do so quickly and quietly.